Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 81 All Out Podcast. This is Siddhartha Vaidyanathan, your host of a podcast named after a heartbreak that happened in 1997. Um, so it is only apt that as specialists in this zone, uh, the regular crew today, Mahesh, uh, Kartikeya and Ashoka are here to discuss the latest installment of uh, heartbreak for uh, in Indian cricket, the World Cup final in 2023, match which finished uh, yesterday in Ahmedabad. Australia won by six wickets with 42 balls remaining. So it was a comprehensive win and uh, India's first defeat in the World Cup in this edition, in this edition of the World Cup. And um, a remarkable game. I mean, if you think about it, and uh, for, for me, I mean, I... Ended up, uh, given the time zones, ended up uh, watching it through the whole night. And uh, it was uh, fantastic to watch. So many, you know, cricketing-wise, so many wonderful passages. A remarkable achievement by Australia. Um, this, I mean, this is not easy to come and uh, start a World Cup with two defeats and then go and win everything else in a row after that. And then to defeat this Indian team in their home patch, Remarkable achievement. I mean, Australia's sixth World Cup victory. Um, they continue to dominate World Cups like a few. They continue to pile on World Cup trophies like a few other teams. And uh, for India, well, it's they're getting closer and closer, but uh, not yet on their hands on the trophy. That since 2011, they've gone to the semi-final in the 2015 World Cup, gone to the semi-final in 2019, final in uh, final this time. So. Maybe the next step will come the next World Cup. Uh, of course, there have been other tournaments as well where they've missed out marginally. Uh, you know, famously the Champions Trophy in 2017 where they lost in the final. And then there have also been other semi-final defeats. And uh, yeah, uh, we can talk about everything. I think one thing to mention though is that there's also a sense of, you know, for a sporting contest, contest is also like, in a sense, it's there's a sense of theatre, right? So... Yesterday, given the crowd, 90,000 plus people at the, gro- at the ground, in a ground with a capacity of, you know, more than 100,000, supposedly 130,000. But yeah, officially there were about 92,000, 91,000, 92,000 people at the ground. But to have that kind of a result to be silenced into, uh, you know, a combination of surprise that moved on into shock, that moved on into anguish, that moved on into, oh my God, why am I here? Uh, that, that, there is something to be said about a sporting contest where you experience that. As much as it is about, you know, going to a ground and cheering and uh, celebrating with, uh, you know, masses of people, cheering your home team, waving a flag. And through the tournament, right? Through the tournament, there have been so many grounds which have been packed, with Indian fans, the sea of blue, and people really, really taking great joy and pride in the way the Indian team has played. They've not only like defeated opponents in the during the course of reaching the final, right? They have dominated them. They have uh, really been the best team in the World Cup till the final. And on that day, I mean, you can still say they were the best team in the World Cup even at the, after the final, because after all, the final is one game. But, uh, yeah, there is a sense of uh, theatre to the whole thing to watch. You know, it um, takes you back to famous moments in sports where these things have happened and are remembered forever and ever. The Famously, the 1950 uh, Football World Cup in Brazil, where the Maracanã, the giant colosseum that is the Maracanã, hosted Brazil against Uruguay. And uh, Uruguay won that match. And uh, that was seen as the, the ultimate heartbreak in Brazilian football uh, and is still seen as the ultimate heartbreak in Brazilian football, despite everything they have won after that. You still mention 1950 uh, Maracanã to people in Brazil, and they would be like, "Oh, that was the biggest tragedy in our uh, history and things." So it's known as it even has a name, the Maracanazo, which is like the Maracanã blow. And so 
you know you know silencing such a big crowd you know australia went to pakistan in 1987 nobody gave them any chance of winning that semi final in 1987 pakistan were the best team in that world cup imran khan had already announced it would be his last game they went they won that match uh, again a remarkable victory i would say comparable to what happened yesterday given the expectations and given the opponents they were facing similar to yesterday pakistan went oh yeah, in 1992 pakistan went to eden park played new zealand new zealand which had gone like unde- almost undefeated through the tournament they lost to pakistan in the league phase but martin crows new zealand were like red hot favorites to win that game but they lost and eden park was turned into silence so yeah it's sort of reminiscent of so many moments like that and i think uh, you know for fans of cricket and for fans of sport this will be something that people will remember for a long time not just for the fact that the indian team lost i mean that's one thing but the remarkable australian victory needs to be acknowledged and how far they have come and how well they have played and how well they adjusted to the conditions so yeah uh let me bring everyone else in uh mahesh thoughts um and hope your son is doing okay Oh, yeah that's going to be my first thought uh, you know we were watching together usually he sleeps after the first session because it's quite late in singapore but fortunately school holiday started just in time for the final so i let him watch through the night and at some stage he was asking questions and then all of a sudden his voice started choking and my wife asked him are you crying he said no and eventually he started crying and uh, i had to console him a little bit and, and i told him it's okay you know india has won two world cups in the past it's okay and he said but australia has won five <laughs> and and this was before the game ended so now they have six and uh and today i was discussing that in office so the you know uh, my boss is an Aussie and and he came to talk about the match i said you guys have claimed another generation of indian fans come on you know when i was growing up india was a weak team australia was a great team so it made sense for us to go through that and now my kid is growing up india is a great team australia is a great team i thought it shouldn't end this way and looks like the australian juggernaut has claimed another generation of indian fans this is a good moment for you right because now okay. father and son have common ground to bond over i mean we have common ground to bond over for sure i didn't want this to be the common bond we talk about cricket every day enough i mean we play cricket he bowls like spin and we talk a lot about that i mean i didn't need a common point like this i mean next thing you'll say you know let him experience an 81 all out i would say no <laughs> no it's always tricky with with kids i mean in, in in my kids of course are now i think they're slowly gravitating towards the Auss- aussie fans because they love this show called bluey which is this australian children's show a really famous children's show and so they were very happy that bluey's team had won and all that so no but i'm saying when it comes to kids and uh, rationality and emotion right it's very tricky because as all of us know that it's very hard to be rational uh, until at, at that age and you actually want to feed that irrationality a bit because love for sport comes a lot from irrationality and so the heartbreaks and defeats and things of course now if you have an uh, you know as an adult if you continue to feel bad about it that's like pretty uh, i mean it's like okay i mean you can only feel bad about it for so long but as a child i think it's important to hold on to that uh, defeat and that uh, memory and the fe- feeling of uh, your team losing for a while you know there's this famous um, uh, charlie brown sort of cartoon which was really famous uh, you know that strip which became really famous because there was a baseball team that um, the uh, charles shields the uh, right uh, cartoonist used to support and they ended up losing like a really close uh, world series uh, game world series uh, sort of title and there was a strip that he posted the next day in the newspaper which had just had charlie brown sitting there looking at the skies and just saying if that ball had just gone one foot lower then they would have taken the catch and we would have won the world series and that's it there's only that one thing uh one strip but then there's this long sort of pause after that it's like he's drawn that long strip right and you're like yeah that's what people think about right if only something had happened you never know so yeah i think it's important to hold on to that especially when you're a child because that nurtures your love for the game 
Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's what uh, I was thinking. And of course, uh, I was telling this in office as well, right? I did the same thing in India, lost in 2003, except I was an adult then. So he had a good excuse to cry. <laughs> No. Um, I mean, I, mean, I think uh, 99 was worse for me than 2003. The 99 Absolutely. Chennai yeah, test yeah, was yeah. worse for me than yeah. the 2003 final defeat. Yeah. No, I'm talking about Australia. I mean, it's not, even 92 Australia loss was, uh, was heartbreaking. And that time I was a kid. So. Yeah, but one thing we have to mention about this Australia, right? If you look at history, of course, there are different, different teams. You can't compare, you know, what the team in the 2003 did to the team here. But if you see ever since... To, not to let's forget 2003 because that doesn't fit in this comparison but 2007 2015 and now australia have uh, and even you can even go back to 99 if you want like australia have beaten the best sides that each country has put in front of them like 2007 sri lanka you can argue was one of the greatest sri lankan sides 2015 new zealand is definitely i think one of the greatest New Zealand sides ever, if not the greatest New Zealand side ever. And this is the greatest Indian side ever. I don't think any of us in this podcast have any doubt about that. They've beaten them all. And 99, they beat Pakistan, which is probably the, you know, one of the greatest Pakistan teams ever. So there is something to be said about that. I mean, they're just, they're just a great cricketing country. They keep producing great teams. It's not, I mean, it's not because they're a mediocre team and they're Australia, somehow they punch about their weight. No, they are a great team. And that is a reflection of that, you know, like for instance, coming into the World Cup, uh, this World Cup final, all of us thought India was the favourites and India was the favourites in these conditions with that bowling attack. And Australia needed uh, some sort of an edge going into the final to to neutralise their advantage. And one, they got it in the form of a toss and they took uh, the sensible decision, some would like to call it the bold decision and they read the pitch beautifully. But it's not just that, right? Are they lucky? Of course, they were lucky, but they had the resources to exploit the luck, right? They had the bowling attack to exploit those conditions to be... I mean, when the ball is not coming onto the bat, it's not easy for like fast bowlers born and brought up in Australia to be able to change and bowl cutters so consistently and, and you know, so like quickly. And even if you look at... Uh, actually, it was a good percentage match. If you look at what India did versus what Australia did, it's very difficult for us to actually say that this was a suboptimal choice by either teams. You know, I mean, we'll talk about it. The the Siraj uh, Shami sort of swap perhaps was suboptimal, but I mean, there are so many such decisions made. You know, in the match, it's it's very difficult to pinpoint one thing or the other. Like if you look at the way Rohit played, and some of us were chatting about it in the in the chat group as well, that that he was perhaps taking too many chances, and a couple of times he got a close shave, but eventually the forty-seven runs proved to be handy, and he the way he got out. He was trying to take on Maxwell because I think Hazelwood was injured and, and uh, or whatever. He went to the dressing room for a brief break. And they had to bowl Maxwell within the first 10 overs. And Maxwell was bowling with two fielders on the leg side. So it was a high... In fact, the six that he hit the previous ball was perhaps a low percentage choice because he hit it right over the fielder. But the shot was a reasonably good percentage shot. And it was an extraordinary catch. So it was... Good percentage cricket from Rohit and good percentage cricket from Australia. And it's just that the chips were falling in Australia's favour. And when India was uh, was bowling, the wicket was easier to play out. I mean, I mean, it's one of those classic things that happens where, you know, when the team is batting, you're bowling first on a, on a day-night game, they have an advantage over the team bowling second. And that's exactly what played out. And that's exactly the kind of margin that Australia needed to offset the natural home advantage and the natural superiority that India had coming into the final. Yep, for sure. And yeah, there is, there is of course, uh, you know, questions about whether, given the conditions, should Rohit have assessed it better and gone back to being uh, slightly older Rohit, right? I mean, where where you play play off the but, initial But, but come on, in things. fact, if you think about it, the, the fact that he ended up with 241 or 241 target is largely a result of the fact that he played the way he did. And he yeah. was lucky to get away with some mistakes as well. And, uh, and, and he, of course, capitalized on other opportunities. In fact, the fact that run rate did not prove to be a problem till about the, the 30th over is largely because of his start. And, no, uh, and I think and it's, uh, you know, it's, it was important to use the hard new ball because we saw like as the innings went along, when the ball got softer, it was it was not coming on at all. I mean, uh, Surya Kumar uh, Yadav, there were moments when he, he was just like waiting, waiting, waiting. But then still, there is no timing that he could get on it because first of all, the bowling was so good. Second of all, the pitch had uh, was becoming harder to bat as the innings went along. So, yeah, Rohit's decision was perfect, I think, to go after the new ball, take the risks. And, you know, he got out to a 
stupendous catch. I mean, sir, that was probably the catch of the World Cup, if you think about it. Running back and taking that catch is like unbelievably hard. It had, uh, Travis had caught on to it. But who knows, like, if that catch hadn't been taken, which, which might not have been taken on, on a, in another day, who knows, he might have gone on to make uh, 80, 90. And because the shot was on. I mean, the shot was on part-time of bowling with the offside, uh, uh, you know, opened up. The shot was on. Yep. Ashoka, we're talking about World Cup. Huh? Don't go into CSK and uh, IPL. Huh? <laughs> but yeah, I was planning to. But uh, anyways, uh, first of all, Om Shanti to all Indian cricket fans. <laughs> uh, we have been thoroughly Om Shanti. Sai Baba refused to smile at us from heaven to yesterday. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why this, yeah. uh, this is Prithvi Shaw's doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, I agree with uh, Mahesh, man. I mean, I mean, I, I think Rohit's approach is justified. Uh, he was uh, trying to hit a lot of uh, shots, and it and forty-seven is what he got, and he had made forties in previous matches as well. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, they saw the pitch and they thought that this is not going to be a three-fifty pitch, so they had to get all the runs up front. So that's what I think. Even Kohli, if you see, he had made uh, 20 odd runs in 12 or 13 balls. So he was also batting very quick. He was trying to make runs uh, whenever it was possible. So yeah. So we can't fault what has happened. Maybe Australia bowled sensationally well from 11 to 40. I think there were only two boundaries that I saw uh, that they had conceded. So they were amazing. Uh, and uh, and obviously Travis had had uh, a lot of luck in his 100 when he batted. Uh, nothing went for the Indians. Nothing much went right for the Indians. So, so yeah, this there was one bad match that was due, man. And I, I think uh, it's unfortunate that India got it in the finals. Uh, but I've been reading some literature since about how it is inevitable that Australia will win tournaments. Australia know how to win tournaments. Australia were born with their DNA modified. All this is another type of rubbish, you know. I mean, this is also writing to the result. The team that won was a very, very good team. That had no, I mean, second opinion there. But India were the team of the tournament. They were the exceptional team in this 11 matches or 10 matches that they played. They, I mean, they are leading in the batting stats, bowling stats everywhere. I mean, this was just one bad day. And therefore, you know... I'll understand the hurt that people have of, because of this match. Because uh, I, because I, even in the last part, I was saying I don't know how this, how, how I don't see how this Indian team can lose. Uh, but now the answer is there. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, it is it is natural that people are sad about how India have not won this World Cup. I thought, you know. Uh, it would be great if they won it. But Australia had a better day. That's all that it is. So, it could have even been South Africa. If South Africa had won the semi-final and had a good day here, even they could have won it. And that's another thing that I was telling you guys. Like, uh, uh, 2023, all four semi-finalists looked really good. I mean, the quality, all four teams had amazing quality. And uh, each one of them could have won the one, two matches on a trot. So... It is. Yeah, it I is mean, the one thing that the three teams, uh, apart from India, the one thing that the three teams, and we've spoken about it, had the sort of the gap was the second spinner, right? So, uh, New Zealand, South Africa, South Africa had Shamsi, but again, he's not, uh, he was a little bit of a unproven quantity in one day as coming in. He did bowl and well it, in that in, semi-final. And it showed, and it showed in that match. I mean, if, if Kuldeep was there in that match instead of Shamsi, or if, if South Africa had a bowler, of Kuldeep's caliber. I mean, even Shamsi, you know, the, the, he couldn't land all six in one spot or he couldn't toss the ball up outside off with such control. He was either too full or a little bit short. So, even though he bowled really well, he he still ha- doesn't have that caliber of Kuldeep. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, yeah, so, that, I mean, coming back to final in India, I think, uh, yeah, so... The one really, really sad thing is that, uh, I mean, uh, even in 2019 and 2023, India had this batch of cricketers that India has put out. I mean, uh, starting from Kohli to, you know, uh, Bumrah. 
one to eleven. This is the best Indian ODI team ever. Possibly also best Test team also. So this is a superlative bunch of cricketers that India has put out, and they are going out without a World Cup uh, ODI World Cup win. That's a little bit of sad uh, state of affairs. That is something that will be disappointing because uh, the the results have not justified or the trophy cabinet has not justified how good this Indian batch of cricketers are. So that is the only sadness. Other than that, I mean, having one bad day, fine. World Cup final, we lost, but it's it was not a one-sided match. Also, I mean, we could have won it had Travis had not gotten that lucky. I mean, he was batting. At some point, KD was pointing out that this, this guy is batting with like seventy percent control and all. So that is Chuma hitting and coming off. So yeah, but yeah. you needed that on that pitch. Like it's, Rohit was also doing that uh, for a while. Uh, they, I mean, you needed that kind of luck on the pitch, and he no to be over, fair, he, over one twenty, over one twenty balls, man. They only batted forty three overs. Over half of that was this guy just. You know, no, using no, a that, ball. It's no, no, but 70, India had overcome 70, such luck against other players because they had deeper resources and the the contest, like at least the pitch. Yeah, yeah. also played, played the already. seventy the seventy percent control was in maybe the first fifty balls of his innings. You know, by the time he had got to his hundred, it, it the control had gone up. Like against the older ball, I mean, nothing much was happening. Like quite, I mean, it's just you know, just a slow pitch. But you see, other batsmen who have scored in this match. uh let's say kohli or rahul or um or or labushen they they using conventional methods they couldn't score that many runs that quickly only Sh- rohit sharma for a brief while and travis head for a long while could do it and you guys are right i mean they needed that kind of you know things to go their way for them to score at that rate at 110 or 120 strike rate or else this was not going to happen uh So yeah, he did it and it worked for him, and it's it's probably one of the best hundreds in the finals, man. So yeah, uh, good for Australia, great win. But I still think the second best team won this tournament. Uh, the most exceptional team lost, had a bad day in the final. So that's kind of where where it is. And that's fine. That happens to so often. I mean, people, you know, there is this tendency to. Uh, no, I'm saying I'm I'm saying this because now there is all this. Uh, Australia have modified gen DNA where they have yeah, yeah, the yeah. talent to win where it matters and all is coming up. I don't subscribe to all that nonsense. They no, no, the Australia no, has been there for hundred years, boss. See, the thing is the that Australianism uh, has been there for hundred years. That Australianism uh, theory discounts Australia's defeats uh, all the time. They only take the victories, right? I mean, Australia lost the semi-final in 2019 to England. What? That was also a knockout game. That was uh, also that where Australian DNA was final. very much uh, everything. Like you can take yeah. everything, and even recently, like their own, there was a World T20 World Cup in Australia where they didn't even make the semi-finals, right? So what yeah. happened to the Australian DNA then? So you Australian DNA and all is convenient to where. and you just to pick the victories and say see they won this they won this they won that they also lost to many along the way so where well, the dna is still there and, and they win a lot of non world cup matches as well i mean they're just a great team exactly so and, and, and that's fine and but the on the opposite side i'm saying and it is totally fine and it happens in across sports that a great team doesn't win the world cup i mean you know most famous uh, like brazil in 1982 everyone will agree like what a fantastic team they were and full of talent and how well they were they didn't win that world cup so what like i remember in 2015 new zealand south africa semi final i felt you know that if anything i just wanted ab de villiers to have a world cup because i felt that you know this is such a great player like once in a lifetime once in a generation kind of player and he poor guy is not going to win a world cup and he never won a world cup you know he's, but that doesn't take away from the fact that he is not one of the greatest uh, Uh, one day players to ever play the game and the same thing with uh, india yesterday i was thinking about gumra and uh, shami and all these uh, guys i mean they such fantastic bowlers did so well through the tournament but gumra has yet to win a world cup and you know if it doesn't happen so be it but doesn't make him any lesser of a bowler kedi uh, apparently uh, you know pat cummins has managed to get rid of justin langer and his elite honesty oh, and consequently okay. His Australia have evolved to a higher plane of existence. You know, I mean, what nonsense, man! They, uh, the, dude, I'll tell you this: if if Australia had lost yesterday, which the chances were pretty high, as we discussed, Cummins would have been branded a woke liberal 
who has no place in captaining the Australian side. I mean, it would have all been just the reverse. So you can you can play this game whichever way you want. Yeah, yeah. but uh, it's worth pointing out that it is a game. No, it is. A, they already have like this amazing cricket to talk about. But we have to play this game, our own game over here. You know, the the, the second is this like the the. Thicket of language which we have to go through, no, to to get to like some batting and some bowling is just with every passing week and with every passing test match, with every passing month, with every season that I follow cricket, it becomes more and more tedious to read anything about cricket because of this. You know, it is like what else? And then the second, the second part of this is that there's always like apparently. A lot of people are convinced that if only these players had done this one particular obvious thing, which they didn't think of, you know, uh, they would have won. And there is no in every dismissal in this in in this final, and actually in every dismissal in almost every single match in this tournament, uh, there isn't an obvious alternative which is better. Okay, they. I mean, this idea that the, you know, Roitza. I mean, the, there was this idea when when this Kohli was out, no, his bold played on to Cummins. Uh, this this idea that uh, people are saying that oh, angled bat, unforced error, you know, and things like. Now, if he did that in a test match, I would agree, you know, because look, in a test match, you consider the value of conceding a dot ball, okay, uh, as opposed to conceding a wicket. You know, and it's not even close. Okay, you 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 can see the dot ball every time, right? Okay, whatever the bass ballers might say, you, if you, if you are not hitting an attacking shot, you consider a dot ball gladly. Like you leave the ball outside off, unless you're actually hitting, it, right? So, but in a one day match, you cannot do that. No, because if you if you actually play Pat Cummins and Josh Hazelwood and Mitchell Stark and Adam Zampa. And you play to the merit of the ball, right? Strictly on this pitch against this bowling, you will score like two or three and over, right? And you cannot afford that, so you have to take a chance. So you have to play the percentages, and you have to play the percentages that you're used to. So and from time to time, it's not going to work. So it, it's it's just one of those things, you know. That it's part of the game, and it, when I say it's part of the game, this is not a cliche. It is literally. The part of the game, you know, that you know, at some point in every ball, the batter has to make an act of faith and say, "Okay, this is where the ball will arrive," and play it, and and not just that this is where the ball will arrive, but this is where the ball will arrive in this moment. Okay, now if it's a two-phase pitch, then your judgment of that moment is a little less certain than it is on a true pitch, right? Uh, and you saw that, like we saw that with Surya Kumar Yadav. Actually, we also saw that with Steve Smith. You know, for a shorter time, and we saw that with Labuschagne. But so you are going to make, you are going to have an error. You know, it's it's the same thing happened to to, to Shreya Sayer. You know, actually, if you think about it, and our friend uh, Karthik Krishna Swami pointed this out, uh, the 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 ball which Shreya Sayer nicked, right? Uh, it's a it's a good length ball, just just outside on the fourth stump, and it straightens just a little bit. And he's not behind the line of the ball. He's trying to sort of, you know, push it into the offside for one. Uh, Travis had did that two or three times uh, to to both Bumra and Shami bowling round the wicket to him. Uh, but unlike Shreya Sayer, who, nick, who nicked a feather, a feather edge to the keeper, uh, Travis had happened to play and miss. You know, now the higher edging and. Head missing is not by design, no. For for head and eye, it's 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 the chips falling more kindly for head and less kindly for eye on the day. But the fact is that chips have fallen pretty kindly for eye throughout the tournament. I mean, he did he has made more than five hundred runs. You know that that doesn't happen if you if you nick. Uh, you know every, every if, if if every time you play and miss you feather, you, you're not going to make five hundred runs in day. Eight or nine games or whatever it is, you know. So there, there isn't an obvious alternative. What could they have done? Nothing, frankly. Uh, 
the fa- the fact is australia are bloody good from 1 to 11 they are an outstanding side the quality that they bring with bat and ball to every single delivery on average is extremely high okay i mean this i mean, you should see i mean i don't know if you seen josh is would bowl live at a cricket ground he can he makes the pitch look small and this rohit sharma is able to run down the pitch and hammer him more, like this is extraordinary man this is not your this is not percentage cricket in this world cup final you know you do not get to the world cup final and play percentage cricket you know that used to happen in the, in in the, in 1996 or 1992 or whatever and not now not not with these players under these rules with 50 years of one day experience behind them you know in the in 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 cricket's various teams you know the the reason they are playing like this is that they've seen uh you know imran khan uh, and javed mehta that play the way they did in the, the middle order in the 90s and and they found that yeah okay that's inefficient there are more efficient options around you know this is most obviously evident in how the openers have changed in one day cricket in the 80s the openers scored so slowly in the 90s that changed because they found new efficiency this is why the game is maturing this is why in every successive generation to get to that same level of excellence is much harder than it was this is why i think that comins is the greatest australian bowler in uh, in history because i think i think lindwall is the best australian bowler since the war i think lily was better than lindwall i think megra was better than lily and i think comins is better than megra because to get to that same level in this era is much harder than it was in megra's era megra's era you know so if you really want to have a conversation about the cricket then you have to consider all this stuff you know i mean i think as far as the match is concerned uh, basically australia had a narrow path to victory than compared to india right the the india could win this match in a lot of different ways but australia could win it in a much smaller set of ways right uh, because india had more spinners uh, india had uh, uh, you know a deeper attack than australia you know australia all said and done you bowled the fifth bowler with what marsh uh Maxwell and Head right uh, and India bowled their fifth bowler with Jadeja or Shami depending on who you count or or Kuldeep so but the thing is that against that sort of thing it's a good idea to chase because when you play an attack like India it's always better to know what target you bowl you know then it is to be in a position where oh get as many as you can because when you have a target it reduces that little bit of you know little bit of calculation you have to do when you are taking chances it reduces that like you you cannot have a innings like manas labushin's like what 15 110 balls or whatever it is he made 58 you cannot have that batting first but you can have that in a 140 chips uh, or 240 chips right so that sort of luxury is not available to you i mean india tried it you know kl rahul played a similar innings to to manas labushin but the point is that india not only the, and and winning the toss in bowling was like the one way that australia could actually win because what that does is first it gives their batters a target right second what it does is that it gives them that one chance of making sure india get a smaller below par score which is to get early wickets and they got three wickets within the first 61 balls and uh, you know one of them was a really great catch you know one of them was you know a, 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 you know an attacking shot which went wrong for shubman gill you know i think he he really was going for uh, trying to hit it over mid on and he didn't get he didn't get the height uh and uh, the, what was the third wicket uh ayer ayer yes ayer who this was a feather yeah so uh, yeah i mean the, the the australian bowling is really good and but we've seen like in 2016 for example uh, the new zealanders also had a sort of similar good fortune and uh, with the new ball against india you know uh, and india chasing uh, i think they got three or four wickets in the first run over that time 2019 so, you mean uh, 2019 sorry yeah so i was thinking okay india made the, the 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 score they made okay you can say it was not enough but how much more could they have made 
to actually be enough like okay imagine india somehow got to 280 would that have been enough i doubt it the way the the way the conditions were out in the second half the way travis head was batting the kind of luck he had um it is very likely that australia could have gone on to get 280 or whatever like it's not it's very hard for me to even gauge what was a good score on that pitch for india because things just no but, but let's let's but let's assume 280 would have won the game for india but how are we going to get 280 where was the inefficiency in that indian batting you know like i don't know who could have batted better i mean kl rahul batted really well i mean they scored four player. boundaries between I over thought, 10 no, no, and no, no. 50 come on that kept being, them in a more <laughs> no but why why did they score four boundaries it was so difficult to bat like surya kumar yadav couldn't put like far last five overs he couldn't connect the ball surya Dude, kumar yadav uh, this will this will not be said but i think kohli played actually the near perfect innings on this on this pitch man i mean uh, when the ball was new hard it was and it was a little easier to bat he scored as many runs as possible and then he no, tried to but, you know but even kohli right, this goes break. back to this goes back to you know kd's argument about control percentage a lot of people have a problem with taking it as an absolute sort of measure right like they're like okay sometimes batsmen edge with a little bit of certainty you know sometimes inside edge they know that it's not going to get played on right you know if kohli's inside edge didn't come out to hit the stumps that would have been categorized as a as a mistake but not a catastrophe like a, like a big mistake right same thing the three fours that each hits of mitchell star the first four was actually a streaky four he could have actually gotten out to that just like how rohit got out to maxwell i'm just saying that there are no risk free options there, there are better percentage options for a certain type of batsman like if you look at rohit the six that he hit of uh, hazelwood was perhaps more streaky than the six that he hit of mitchell stark but that the difference is so marginal my point with respect to kohli is that he's just a master of this uh, you know keeping runs and balls close together irrespective of the pitch that even after he knew that once he had that you know uh, 20 odd in like 10 balls he he knew that he had some space to you know leave a little a uh, few balls respect the conditions and the bowling and yet keep that ball and run um, uh, thing equation close enough uh, maybe i mean maybe rahul is the one who should have actually thought of taking that risk because kohli if not for that mistake he would have stayed there forever man you know stayed till the end but they can't no they are three down in the 10th over like there's 40 overs to play and there's only like two or three wickets between that and chami man i mean they have to i mean they if they attack they could be six down in the 23rd over and then the final is over You know, and so we saw that with Pakistan chance. no they fell for yeah. they 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 fell for 190 so the question is do you take a chance and risk go getting all out for 180 yeah. 190 or do you play and uh, go for 240 250 and i'm guessing the indian team were thinking 260 but the uh, uh, sky could just not time the ball i mean yeah. on a good day surya kumar yadav would have taken that score to 260 but the australia bowled so well on that pitch and the pitch was so like uh, spongy it's not easy for a stroke maker like that to hit so freely i mean uh, kohli's batting has been terrific in this in this tournament and it was it was terrific in the final as well but he's he, he's he never misses a run that is being offered and that's a important distinction you know kohli is unlikely to go manufacturing runs you know he's not going to play a reverse sweep for instance you know just because the there isn't a, a deep point you know or he isn't going to like you know step over to the off side and try to you know lap it over the short fine leg you know like even <laughs> even kl rahul will play that shot from time to time but kohli is not but what kohli is absolutely and peerless at i think like there's nobody else like him in the world at this is that his game is good enough to extract every last run that the that the bowling and field setting offers i mean especially in one day cricket where there he's always got at least four boundary fielders to hit you know and he can hit them from pretty much every line and every length and he can hit them for one he can hit them for two occasionally he can hit them for four he can beat them uh i mean the that thing he does no where against the spinner uh he often plays back to a fairly full ball 
and punches it down the ground. And that punch of his, when he's not playing well, it goes to the mid-wicket fielder. But most of the time, he plays it well enough to hit it to mid-on. That's an amazing thing. You know, that Kohli is an amazing one-day player. He, he, he really is. I mean, he's, he's an extraordinary batter. And in this year and in this tournament, especially the, our privilege has been that he's been in form. You know, he's, he's found his touch and he's been, been back in form and he's been just sensational. It's, it, it, he really has. I, no, and one has to also, like when you're talking about the, we're talking about the Kohli-Rahul partnership, right? And the fact that India hit only uh, four boundaries between overs 10 and 50. We have to also mention how accurate and fantastic Australia's fast bowlers were. I mean, there was a yeah. time when uh, the field was set was a predominantly leg side field. I mean, there were people close on the leg side and there were people in the boundary. And the Australian bowlers were getting that ball at a perfect line uh, around, you know, the middle and leg stump. And they were challenging the Indian batters to go for it. Like, if you have to get runs, if you really want to get boundaries, you have to beat the fielders there and you have yeah. to play that full shot or you have to play, you have to manufacture that shot. And it's yeah, hard I mean, to... They, yeah. The Australians, I think, they they bowled to their three-wicket advantage really, like, brilliantly. They... They they exploited that like superbly, you know. They're, they're, and and you and you should not be surprised that they did, man. These are really, really world class bowlers. No, no, but on the contrary, I mean, you should not be surprised. On the contrary, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. I mean, they don't play in these conditions for someone like. Uh, uh, what's his name? The Zampa. We understand, right? He's skilled enough to exploit these conditions, but for the fast bowlers to be able to sort of. One, this is what we admire about Bumrah, right? Every time he decides to bowl a slower ball, it's not just a conception, it's an execution, right? So, sim- I mean, and that's just some of those genius balls. But for these guys to kind of bowl with the discipline and just sort of surrender themselves to the pitch and change their bowling style just for that one day and to be so precise in that execution, I think it deserves a lot of credit. They bowl beautifully. It's not, okay, the, the simplest, I mean, as Keddy said, if Australia had narrower path to victory, the toss became a crucial thing. Right. But the toss is only an advantage if you have the resources to exploit it. Right. And Australia had the resources to exploit it and they did exploit it. So, you know, honestly, when I was watching Pat Cummins yesterday, I was like, if after the game or at some point in the future, if Pat Cummins and Jaspreet Bumrah were to have a conversation, I think Bumrah would doff his hat to how Cummins bowled yesterday because that is exactly how Bumrah would have approached the bowling. I mean, 10 overs for 34 and 2 wickets, man. I mean, that's like for a fast bowler to... It's, I almost feel like it's like swallowing your ego and saying, okay, these are the conditions. I'm here to restrict. I'm here to win the match. I have to take wickets even though... Like, I don't... It's not about relying on pace and swing and seam only. I mean, that is, you know, the things that you associate with fast bowling. This was such expert fast bowling in which Cummins was bowling cutters. He was varying his length. That And then he was suddenly mixing it up with the quicker one. So, the batter is basically faced with such a wide range of speeds, such a wide range of length. And he was remarkable. I mean, yesterday's. Uh, I mean, the uh, remove, cups, remove, remove the two overs of uh, Hazelwood where he got hammered by Rohit. And see his figures then. He's, he's bowled eight overs for 20 odd. He, so, there was no out. I mean, one end Cummins is bowling, the other end Hazelwood is bowling. There is no out for Surya Kumar Yadav or... Kail Rahul. Oh. They were just, yeah, buried. Yeah. No, and it and it's not easy, you know. It's not easy when you have uh, grown up bowling a certain style, when you've grown up on pitches which suit a certain style to suddenly, you know, to make this change. I mean, Bumrah can do it because Bumrah has seen these kind of pitches all his life. And Bumrah can adjust it that way. But imagine going to like this completely new pitch and finding ways to restrict runs and take wickets. This is a remarkable skill. And I think Cummins and, yeah, Hazelwood, Stark, Stark is the much more attacking option, right? Like, he he's a great bowler. But Stark is, uh, you know, he he went with what he does. But Hazelwood and Cummins, for me, were the, just a, a class apart yesterday. Yeah, but, you know, there's another thing which is, uh, is that, you know, there are bowlers who bowl for wickets and 
a lot of the time they're good enough to get them. You know, like Dale Stain, he used to bowl for wickets. He like pitch it up and hope it, hope it moved. And his seam position was so good that he actually got that late movement. You know, uh, and and on the days when he didn't move, he used to go for runs. You know, uh, I think Rabata to a large extent is also like that. Very very attacking. He bowls for wickets and he's good enough for, to, to get wickets. You know, and then uh, on the downside of that, you have like Hari Rao or Mark Wood, and uh, in these conditions, they are <coughs> uh, what they know and what they are able to do. You know, their range is not like as good as like Cummins's range. You know, even though you know both of them are pace wise. You know, in Wood's case, I think they maybe are even uh, on average a little quicker than Cummins. But the point is. This idea that you don't bowl to get wickets, you know, that you you find a line and length where you hold, you you control the game, you know, and then you then you get wickets because the batter is forced into doing just that little bit extra, you know. That is, I mean, in a sense, Australia did to India what India has been doing to opponents all tournament, you know, which is. You know, Bumra and Chami and all, you see their interviews and you see their polling more than their interviews. And what do they say? They say, well, we are looking for well, what is the correct length to bowl here? What is the, what is the correct length means what? Is that like, what is the most optimal length to bowl here given what is offered on offer? You know, if it's moving, then you bowl one length. If it's not moving, you bowl another length. If it's slow, you bowl another length. You know, and it's one thing to say that. You know, you and I can also say that if we look at the, if you were, if we put in the work and look at the figures. But it's a totally another to actually do it. You know, like you could have a bowler who's suddenly trying to bowl those off cutters, and you know he's he's letting the ball fly down the leg side twice every over. You know that that you that wouldn't work. But these guys are at this level, like Cummins, Bobra, Hazelwood. I mean, that's why they are great bowlers. I mean, this is just. The the sort of the the skill level and the range on display was quite something. But the 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 other thing that happened is that when India bowled, they were not able to do that. You know, they, they were not able to sit back and you know bowl a length and wait for the wickets. They had to go chasing wickets. And I think the biggest sign that they had to do that was that India uh, switched uh, Shami and Siraj. You know. Which, if you know, if you were if you were to say that, okay, what is the closest thing that they did that is, you know, perhaps, you know, you could argue was something like a mistake. And I think it was that. I think I think it it didn't work because you know Shami doesn't like the new ball. He hasn't bowled with the new ball in a long time. Uh, it moved too much. He was not able to control it. Uh, even that first wicket he got was like you know I don't know. Like, uh, I mean, Australia came out like, you know, basketball on steroids. They came out like they wanted to murder the bowling the first five overs. Uh, you know, and like Warner was throwing his bat at everything. Uh, but India could not like do their usual thing, which is to sit back and wait for the error. You know, in part that was because, you know, every few balls like, you know, Travis Head would just slog sweep uh, the spinner from the stumps or, you know, loft the spinner or something and, and he's middling everything. But the other thing was also that, you know, they felt they had to bowl Australia out and that they felt, I think, that they had to do it within the, mostly within the first 25-30 overs of the innings. You know, because as things got older, there would be less help. Uh, and that was, they were probably right about that. But you know, so so this was a in cricket terms, this was such an interesting sort of inversion of a game. You know, it was it was basically the opening game of the World Cup in reverse, pretty much exactly. You know, no, the the and, one the point about uh, Shami and Siraj uh, is interesting because it uh, you know the way Shami was bowling yesterday. Uh, there was this Baratarun piece, right, that he wrote about Shami in Cricket Info. I can link that. Uh, where Baratharun said that, he said many things about Shami's bowling, which are very interesting. But one of the things he said is that earlier Shami used to try, you know, he was trying for wickets uh, so often that the ball used to often go down the leg side because he was trying to, you know, get it straight. Yeah. It used to go down the leg side and the batters used to then get get away with the runs. But the biggest 
thing he is doing in this World Cup is he, that he is getting so many wickets because he is not trying for wickets. He is yeah. trying to, you know, his his aim is not to get wickets. His aim is something else. His aim is to keep the length and keep the runs down, and then wickets are coming. So, but yesterday, given the situation of the game, given the low total India had, I felt that India had to chase wickets, and that was actually counterproductive to that because the ball was like. swinging a lot man in the early part of that things and guys were you know the guys were going fours were going i think that became a little harder to control that ball given how much it was swinging and also given the fact that they were they des- they wanted wickets they had to get wickets but quickly. see but see that they would still take it no i mean that's still a marginal call and it it did work we got three wickets out for 47 runs uh, all said and done uh, india benefited from that move also the the thing that probably hurt india a lot apart from the small score is that the pitch eased out it skidded on right in fact uh, that's uh, pretty much what uh, uh, stuart broad uh, you know at the toss he made this point he posted a tweet stuart broad and he said that uh, it's always better in these conditions because in the afternoon with such a dry pitch jadeja will be a handful so it's and but with the lights later on in the evening you could get the ball skidding on and it may become easier to bat so and yeah. he said that at the toss so yeah uh, it no, that's no, but pretty that's much true of a lot of the day night odi matches right uh, yeah. except that the, usually the wicket plays pretty well in the afternoon then it gets it skids a lot more in the night no but no but if the, you see like calcutta calcutta becomes very harder to bat as you go along also so the pitch takes more turn as you go along but some other grounds don't necessarily do that no, no i mean no, but another, typically another, when the wicket is slow and it kind of doesn't come out to the bat in the first half of the session uh, usually it, it, it is true that the wicket plays truer in the night no another another thing that actually you know played uh, against india is that uh, uh, marnes labushian decided to shut shop once he got in he he decided that uh, as long as head is playing whatever he is playing there was no need to you know uh, because the batters who came before him they were all taking crazy amount of risks marsh was going for this total as if he had to chase it down in like 20 overs even warner was doing that head was doing that and it looked like they were intent on you know hitting this attack out of you know uh getting this target in like 25 30 overs then they got out and steve smith got one dubious decision though i thought that was a fantastic ball uh he got uh, a bad decision probably he could have come on it was not a bad decision man come on oh, it, it looked it out like man the only bad decision there was probably travis said not suggesting a, smith review there's a interesting cricket thing in there even travis said's decision uh, Choice not to tell Smith to review. No, is a perfectly reasonable thing. Usually, Smith no. Basically, Smith was caught on the crease. You know, normally Smith will shuffle across the stumps, which means that his back foot comes across. So when he's hit on the back leg, he knows that he's outside the line of the off stump. You know, that's why he reviews so care so caution. This time he was caught on the crease. You look at. I mean, there's a. I, I made a screenshot and I I looked at this, and he's still side on. You know his back leg has not moved at all. You know he's basically been sort of frozen by the by the change up essentially. Like that, that that happens a lot in baseball. But here basically that's what happened. I mean he was beaten neck and crop. You know so yeah. I mean it, the archive shows that it's hit outside the line, but that's not really an umpire live umpiring error. Right? There's nothing obviously wrong with the decision. I mean and plum you you real you can't you can't tell no live that. that that freeze frame is not available to you live no the pad is on the move the ball is also on the move there's a bat coming down no there's you so know the earlier, going on uh, earlier i mean I, uh, the pattern that i've noticed in this tournament is umpires if they are if they think it is really really plum they give it even if they think there is some marginal issue they don't because they know that teams are anyways going to take the drs so they don't you know uh, do things if they are not sure so i thought you know this i i always thought it was hitting slightly outside off and i mean this was a very brave call by the umpire to give it out because that goes against the trend of them not giving it out so i, do, I don't think umpires calculate the the review 
sort of tactics and all that when they're giving out i mean yeah, it is just give one ball at a time but that will never be called the ball of the century or the ball of the tournament or whatnot because it was some ball of the freaking amazing. millennium man it, it is the amazing. it is the it was a stunning ball it was one of those bumra classics where oh man the deception that he can execute is unbelievable he's a he can he's a spinner at heart actually it's like almost like shane warne level deception that he pulls off with the slow one one of the sad parts about like the 90s and the 2000s is that you know there were so few people who had access to like the footage of the 92 world cup and stuff no so that so that that small spell that wasim akram bowled to england you know where he has like alan lamb out and all that that goes like becomes like legendary you know they did whereas you know wasim akram probably bowled like that several times a year in the in that in that period you know like like i probably bowled even better like i like all those test matches west indies and pakistan played in the late 90s i mean akram must have bowled spells like that somewhere man but there's no footage of those things so those things are gone whereas actually oh, actually there was a brief there was a very small footage of the bridgetown uh, test in the oh, late 80s and uh, you can you can see akram bowling there and it, it's yeah. a very grainy footage and it's uh, yeah. sort of at a distance but he's amazing he's stunning but these yeah. days this is like so uh, you know this is like so uh, and bumrah has bowled some like it's art man. it's art it's just, it's that 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 off off cut he bowled to rizwan and then you know the leg leg the leg cutter he pulled are following that to the next batch i think his name is iftika uh, those are like no 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 shadab everybody. shadab khan shadab, shadab khan. khan yeah those would have bowled anybody and this one i mean uh, this is the thing right it, it's 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 fascinating to see those balls and you see this ball to smith right and and people say oh a better batsman would have played that no man those are unplayable nobody can that's what a unplayable ball is you can't do anything about it you know it's just it's just it's moving too much too late from too good a length that it's beyond human reflexes to react to it so you have to either have guessed right or you're gone you're dead you see bowlers from around the world you see the level of adjustment and the quick the swiftness with which he is able to just quickly you know pull that gauge back and then continue to get the bat- batter in trouble get the wickets that's a remarkable quality to have i mean you it's you a lesser bowler a lesser bowler cannot do that they don't have the skill because, sets because because when you use words like pull back or you know change length people think that there is some people associate distance with it and the distance is not at all much in cricket it's like centimeters man centimeter left right top bottom that's how you adjust and that level of adjustment at that pace and you know uh, repeatedly he's he's adjusting at will is that is what causes you know all the wonderment you can't i mean adjusting centimeters or you know uh, bowling it slightly to the left or right to control the swing or the way the ball ends up when it crosses the batsman that is what you know is is incomprehensible to people who you know don't play cricket or or when they watch cricket you don't see what is happening what magical thing is happening in front of you mm, even i am playing cricket i mean yeah to 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 do so face up to bumrah yeah it is really magic no the way he bowled to travis there after the first over he could have gotten him out multiple times the way he was squaring him up like the first thing he realized is he was giving him too much width so he cut down the angle he came around the wicket and he started bowling on the off stump and it was going like an off spinner you know he could have gone out multiple times I mean, and uh, perhaps you know like that's the that's the kind of path that would have worked in india's favor even after all the disadvantages of losing the toss and scoring 240 if bumrah had a couple of edges from those magic balls things could have been different you know, i was laughing this there was one ball when sami bowled from around the stumps to to head it it came from you know wide outside heads off stump into his body this guy did not even move his feet he just offered the bat straight up and once it reaches the bat it just moves away to you know offside instead of going holding on to the path in what can a batsman do dude i mean this is the batsman who scored 137 on the day he had no yeah. idea what to do to that second movement that the ball had and that was shami and he was supposed to have a bad day listen 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 you have been hyping up this indian bowling attack is the greatest thing since sliced bread and they didn't win a world cup final 
and you are making on their own excuses in their own here. conditions in their own conditions yeah. and you are making up excuses here you said three great fast bowlers two great spinners and in your home now, what excuses they don't need defending man and and also no. are you also, saying the fact that it was a final had nothing to do with the performance no oh, that had nothing way. to do with the performance no no but i'll tell you what could have had to do with the performance one thing that could have had to do is they were defending 240 like there was only one other match where india yeah. scored a low score which was against england and they were up against an england team which was very low on confidence and who didn't who weren't batting well and that yeah. lucknow pitch was different from this pitch because it was not it didn't suddenly become easier to uh, like it didn't quicken up and didn't become easier to but bat also lucknow i think the bounce was a little lower than here yeah it was it was different and so that was the only match where india had to defend a low total otherwise every other match the indian bowlers were they were talking about 300 you're proving plus. my point silvi you're proving my point so the so only who scored be able to be held uh, as a great bowling attack no i think see first of all if at all you have to analyze this match from a batting bowling perspective if, if which, at all you have is, to blame someone you have to blame rohit sharma man. that is what a corner <laughs> is trying to avoid He is putting the blame on bowlers because now you come to the correct point. Captain did not have the responsible slogger. Slogger Tala for a reason. Tala came and finished the match off. This and guy. Ashoka, if you remember, if you remember Ashoka, my man Cummins, he has put the example in front of uh, Arohit Sharma of how to how to play a captain's innings. Yeah, you know, he did it twice. You, yeah mahesh we, we exactly. have understood you understood your uh, thing you are just throwing stones at indian bowling to shield your precious rohit sharma we we will not allow this it was the same rohit sharma who swapped uh, shami and siraj the point of resentment for the common fan is look at these guys they are making millions of dollars they are making they are making me spend time on watching them and yet when i watch which is usually the semi final of final when i watch when i am uh, taking away sleep and uh, thing they are not winning so that is the point of resentment and we can we can ridicule it but there's also a sort of the uh, other capitalistic side to it right like which mike mike marcusi of course famously touched on in the war minus the shooting where he's like that's the expectation that you're building up for the fan you're building up the expectation so much that when the things drop you do, you you stop treating it as a game when the team loses you stop treating it as a game and you treat it as like a failure of like a national failure that's not unmediated between the players and the fan you know i think that the, there is a big sort of entity in the middle which sort of spins these stories and perpetuates yeah called the media and, uh, yeah and the a large part of the 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 press no especially sort of the let's be generous and call them veterans the cynic in me has this view that you know the the veterans of the press corps now have made the calculation that you know their usual psychobabble about mentality and weakness and fragility and uh, you know uh, failure on the big day and all that okay. that sort of choking that did didn't turn up when it mattered and all that usual you know that that shelf of their you know the one shelf that they got Uh, that you know the uh, one book shall that they, that's not going to fly you know so because you know the audience is not ready to hear that so they've gone you know in the other direction they say oh it doesn't matter one bad day we are with you is that uh. but the point is in either case they are still not willing to have i say anything about any batting or bowling that drives me up the wall man it i i click i go to the sports page i want sports man i will tell you about the wrong sports. you're Sorry, looking I in the wrong place i will i will tell you about sports i will tell you about resentment you are asking what is the resentment of the common fan i will tell you justice for ashwin justice for ashwin Play, correct ashwin should have played in the world t20 world t- uh, test championship final he should have played here he would have actually won two trophies The problem is this that this team management does not listen to Krishna Macharya Shrikam. Yes. The day before the match, he saw the pitch and he said he he knocked on it. Okay, he knocked on it six times. One knock said tuk tuk tuk. The other knock said tuk tuk tuk. Which that is that is all Chika is talking about it on his show. Huh? Apparently, that means 
that the pitch is both hollow and solid. And one part it is hollow and one part it is solid. And he said, Ashwin is the only way India can win this match. Now, nobody listened to him. And then you lose this match. And then you say, why we lost this match and analysis and all. Because you didn't listen to him, no? Niklo Sabi, Dravid ka fans. Niklo. Aisi ki taisi. Oh, your Hindi has come. Yeah. This is this is Ashoka's tribute to uh, you know the the YouTube Ifi channel Wasse. Wasse Ifi and Wasse. Ifi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Who are the I mean, stars guys, of this World Cup? Yes, and, uh, and and I I am bringing this up mainly because he has got me hooked on them, and I have since discovered that like while the actual World Cup has been going on, these guys have been playing their own imaginary World Cup in which Sarfaraz Ahmed is still captain of Pakistan and he's doing he, all magic things. Ashwin for Siraj would have been a perfectly reasonable decision on this pitch. Okay, uh, I'll give you I'll give you some more ammunition for the Ashwin for Siraj thing. Okay. Now after the toss, Rohit Sharma said he would have batted first. Right? If that's true, uh, and if they were anyway going to switch Shami and Siraj around, then there was a case for playing Ashwin instead of yeah. Siraj. For sure. Yeah. But I think he switched him because of 240. I don't think he would have switched if it was 300, for instance. Yeah, yeah. That's for you and me, you are reasonable people. Man. <laughs> we are, this is justice for Ashwin segment. These guys are mocking Ashwin fans and they're playing with our sentiments. I will not allow this. <laughs> Overall, this one thing that we must remember is that, you know, the unlike like, uh, you know, World Series or Super Bowl or things that happen every year, a World Cup comes around, especially a one-day World Cup comes around only once in four years. And then who knows how many of these players are going to be around, how many of them are going to play in the next World Cup and all that. So, I think that that level of hurt will definitely be there. Like, Rohit, who, will Rohit Sharma play the next World Cup? I doubt it. Will Virat Kohli play the next World Cup? Well, he might because he's the fittest guy going around. But again, I doubt it. So, Mohamed Shami... I am pretty sure that he won't be around. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of missed opportunity there. But um, I think as a core, this is like a fantastic Indian team. And, you know, Gil, Rahul, Shreyas Ayer, uh, Siraj, Bumra, they're all going to be around, hopefully. And uh, I think this is a great sort of foundational core for the Indian team. This World Cup is a fantastic experience for them to have gone through. To have been the such a to have been such a juggernaut through the tournament, and I yeah one match of course you can feel bad about it and you know there will be heartbreak up opportunity but they'll be back and they'll be really good and it's great I mean in fact I'm looking forward to watching this team more and more because they bring so much to the game they bring so much of greatness to the game and joy. No, to we the have game. we have to we have to be generous and say. That whatever you just said of India also applies to New Zealand, also applies to South Africa, also applies sure. to also applies to Australia. Afghanistan. They are all Afghanistan Afghanistan, at least they are a young team. There are a lot yeah. of 20, 22 year olds, so they might play. But these four teams have a lot of 30 year olds, early 30, mid 30 year olds, who are all part of once in a generation squads. I mean, New Zealand, this is their greatest squad ever. Australia. I mean, probably, at least New Zealand. They got the World Test Championship. I mean, there is yeah. that that one sort of bit of a trophy that they got for their greatest team. But uh, South Africa and India waiting. All these athletes that we have enjoyed over the last eight, nine years, they're going to move away and there's going to be a definite transition. Like, uh, we have already seen that in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, they, where they are fielding a lot of 20-year-olds and a lot of new people are coming in. So that is going to happen across these teams as well. So, will these new guys be of that caliber? Will we see another Cummins or a Bumra or a Kohli or a Rohit? That is, I, I mean, I am, I've always been cynical because these players are like, you know, exceptions rather than a rule. I don't know how a system can produce a genius. A genius always comes despite a system. No, So, I don't know. But if cricket surprises me, I mean, uh, many people thought, I mean, uh, let me, I mean, I was watching this finals with people who have left cri- watching cricket in like 2003-2007. Oh. So, I was telling them, I was telling them, you guys have missed out a lot of good stuff because a lot of good stuff has happened in the last eight years. So, it is, you know, viable to be an optimist and say, 
na lot more good players will come i mean cricket might get even more competitive so i mean i am to kind of holding point out. right after dennis lilly you could have said we will never have an australian fast bowler as good as this but megra did come comins did come stark did come i mean you know the they 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 will keep coming because they because the sport is getting better players are getting fitter technology is, sure, you know yeah. science is better like people have more knowledge of things data is there more numbers so and money more money in cricket than ever before so it's bound to happen i mean it's not like cricket is some you know sport that is dying that is looking for you know survival and all we keep arguing about whether one day is dead or whether test cricket is dead but there is a enormous amount of money in cricket man and so it's only natural that better players will come i won't be shocked if we get a, a bowler who is approaching shami or a bowler who is approaching you know siraj yeah, yeah. because a system can produce those we bowlers are, and they will something new no we might get something another something very original thank you for um, joining us through this world cup it's been good fun doing these uh, reviews and podcasts and talking about games and themes thanks to mahesh ashokan and kartikeya for being able to join thanks to all our listeners who have been sending us feedback and thoughts and you know uh, also expectantly asking when we are going to record and things all that makes a difference we are very grateful we are also very grateful for those of you who have been contributing on coffee that's ko-fi.com/81allout it's been you know great to get your contributions and uh, for anyone else who wants to chip in feel free i'll put in the link in the site and in the podcast platforms you can subscribe review rate please review and rate our podcast it's important because uh, you know it becomes easy for other people to find us and uh, you can read the books that we have put out republished uh, war minus the shooting by mike markasi cricket beyond the bazaar by mike coward and the summer game by gideon hay and all three books you know actually very interesting and in this moment because war minus the shooting was about the 1996 world cup that was held in the subcontinent so you can read it and you can compare that world cup to this one uh, cricket beyond the bazaar was about the australian team of the 1980s and uh, you know their trips to the subcontinent you can read about that about alan borders team and about a young steve war and nick dermot and dean jones and the achievements of that team including the 1987 world cup that i just spoke about my coward has a whole chapter on that and it's fascinating to read and of course the summer game by gideon hay which is the history of australian cricket from the 50s and 60s uh, another fascinating period in australian cricket history which tells you so much more about their approach to cricket and what how cricket was as a game how it evolved how it became so integral to australian society and so on anyway thank you and uh, we'll uh, join you in about a week or 10 days time i'm sure we will have a little bit more to say about this world cup and this indian team and a few other things and also there are other series coming up and i'm most uh, eagerly looking forward to some tests that are going to be played as well later in the year uh, south india are going to south africa and then there will be a uh, england coming over to india early next year so there'll be plenty to talk about thanks so much good night and uh, take care india have won the series they're going to get back for two india home lords goes one